Chapter Eight. Just as Hulot was going into the opera house, he was stopped by the darkened appearance of the building and of the Rue Le Pelletier, where there were no gendarmes, no lights, no theatre servants, no barrier to regulate the crowd. He looked up at the announcement board and beheld a strip of white paper on which was printed the solemn notice, closed on account of illness. He rushed off to Josepha's lodgings in the Rue Chauchat, for, like all the singers, she lived close at hand. "'Whom do you want, sir?' asked the porter, to the baron's great astonishment. "'Have you forgotten me?' said Hulot, much puzzled. "'On the contrary, sir, it is because I have the honour to remember you that I ask you. Where are you going?' A mortal chill fell upon the baron. "'What has happened?' he asked. If you go up to Mademoiselle Mirat's rooms, Monsieur le Baron, you will find Mademoiselle Héloise Brisetout there, and Monsieur Bichiu, Monsieur Léon de Laura, Monsieur Lousteau, Monsieur de Vernisset, Monsieur Stidman, and ladies smelling of patchouli, holding a housewarming. Then where, where is Mademoiselle Mirat? I don't know that I ought to tell you. The Baron slipped two five-franc pieces into the porter's hand. Well, she is now in the Rue de la Ville l'Eveque, in a fine house given to her, they say, by the Duc d'Herouville, replied the man in a whisper. Having ascertained the number of the house, Monsieur Hulot called a milord and drove to one of those pretty modern houses with double doors, where everything, from the gaslight at the entrance, proclaims luxury. The baron, in his blue cloth coat, white neckcloth, nankeen trousers, patent leather boots, and stiffly starched shirt frill, was supposed to be a guest, though a late arrival, by the janitor of this new Eden. His alacrity of manner and quick step justified this opinion. The porter rang a bell, and a footman appeared in the hall. This man, as new as the house, admitted the visitor, who said to him in an imperious tone and with a lordly gesture, Take in this card to Mademoiselle Josepha. The victim mechanically looked round the room in which he found himself, an anteroom full of choice flowers and of furniture that must have cost twenty thousand francs. The servant, on his return, begged Monsieur to wait in the drawing-room till the company came to their coffee though the baron had been familiar with imperial luxury which was undoubtedly prodigious while its productions though not durable in kind had nevertheless cost enormous sums he stood dazzled dumbfounded in this drawing-room with three windows looking out on a garden like fairyland one of those gardens that are created in a month with a made soil and transplanted shrubs while the grass seems as if it must be made to grow by some chemical process he admired not only the decoration the gilding the carving in the most expensive pompadour style as it is called and the magnificent brocades all of which any enriched tradesman could have procured for money but he also noted such treasures as only princes can select and find can pay for and give away two pictures by Greuze, two by watteau two heads by van dyck two landscapes by reistyle and two by le gaspre a rembrandt a holbein a murillo and a titian two paintings by tenier and a pair by metsu a van heysom and an abraham mignon in short two hundred thousand francs worth of pictures superbly framed the gilding was worth almost as much as the paintings aha now you understand my good man said josepha she had stolen in on tiptoe through a noiseless door over persian carpets and came upon her adorer standing lost in amazement in the stupid amazement when a man's ears tingle so loudly that he hears nothing but that fatal knell the words my good man spoken to an official of such high importance so perfectly exemplified the audacity with which these creatures pour contempt on the loftiest that the baron was nailed to the spot josepha in white and yellow was so beautifully dressed for the banquet that amid all this lavish magnificence she still shone like a rare jewel isn't this really fine said she the duke has spent all the money on it that he got out of floating a company of which the shares all sold at a premium he is no fool is my little duke 
there is nothing like a man who has been a grandee in his time for turning coals into gold just before dinner the notary brought me the title deeds to sign and the bills receipted they are all a first-class set in there d'escrignon rastignac maxime lenoncourt vernet laginsky rochefide la palferine and from among the bankers nucingen and du Tillet, with antonia malaga carabine and le chance and they all feel for you deeply yes old boy and they hope you will join them but on condition that you forthwith drink up two bottles full of hungarian wine champagne or cup just to bring you up to their mark my dear fellow we are all so much on here that it was necessary to close the opera the manager is as drunk as a cornet a piston he is hiccuping already oh josepha cried the baron now can anything be more absurd than explanations she broke in with a smile look here can you stand six hundred thousand francs which this house and furniture cost can you give me a bond to the tune of thirty thousand francs a year which is what the duke has just given me in a packet of common sugared almonds from the grocers a pretty notion that what an atrocity cried hulot who in his fury would have given his wife's diamonds to stand in the duc d'herouville's shoes for twenty-four hours atrocity is my trade said she so that is how you take it well why don't you float a company goodness me my poor dyed tom you ought to be grateful to me i have thrown you over just when you would have spent on me your widow's fortune your daughter's portion what tears the empire is a thing of the past i hail the coming empire she struck a tragic attitude and exclaimed they call you hulot nay i know you not and she went into the other room through the door left ajar there came like a lightning flash a streak of light with an accompaniment of the crescendo of the orgy and the fragrance of a banquet of the choicest description the singer peeped through the partly open door and seeing hulot transfixed as if he had been a bronze image she came one step forward into the room monsieur said she i have handed over the rubbish in the rue chauchat to bichu's little eloise brise too if you wish to claim your cotton nightcap your boot jack your belt and your wax dye i have stipulated for their return this insolent banter made the baron leave the room as precipitately as lot departed from gomorrah but he did not look back like mrs lot hulot went home striding along in a fury and talking to himself he found his family still playing the game of whist at two sous a point at which he left them on seeing her husband return poor adeline imagined something dreadful some dishonour she gave her cards to hortense and led hector away into the very room where only five hours since crevel had foretold her the utmost disgrace of poverty what is the matter she said terrified oh forgive me but let me tell you all these horrors and for ten minutes he poured out his wrath but my dear said the unhappy woman with heroic courage these creatures do not know what love means such pure and devoted love as you deserve how could you so clear-sighted as you are dream of competing with millions dearest adeline cried the baron clasping her to his heart the baroness's words had shed balm on the bleeding wounds to his vanity to be sure take away the duc d'herouville's fortune and she could not hesitate between us said the baron my dear said adeline with a final effort if you positively must have mistresses why do you not seek them like crevel among women who are less extravagant and of a class that can for a time be content with little we should all gain by that arrangement i understand your need but i do not understand that vanity oh what a kind and perfect wife you are cried he i am an old lunatic i do not deserve to have such a wife i am simply the josephine of my napoleon she replied with a touch of melancholy josephine was not to compare with you said he come i will play a game of whist with my brother and the children i must try my hand at the business of a family man 
I must get Hortense a husband and bury the libertine. His frankness so greatly touched poor Adeline that she said, the creature has no taste to prefer any man in the world to my Hector. Oh, I would not give you up for all the gold on earth. How can any woman throw you over who is so happy as to be loved by you? The look with which the baron rewarded his wife's fanaticism confirmed her in her opinion that gentleness and docility were a woman's strongest weapons. But in this she was mistaken. The noblest sentiments carried to an excess can produce mischief as great as do the worst vices. Bonaparte was made emperor for having fired on the people at a stone's throw from the spot where Louis the Sixteenth lost his throne and his head because he would not allow a certain Monsieur Sos to be hurt. On the following morning Hortense, who had slept with the seal under her pillow so as to have it close to her all night, dressed very early, and sent to beg her father to join her in the garden as soon as he should be down. By about half-past nine the father, acceding to his daughter's petition, gave her his arm for a walk, and they went along the quays by the Pont Royal to the Place du Carousel. "'Let us look into the shop windows, papa,' said Hortense, as they went through the little gate to cross the wide square. "'What, here?' said her father, laughing at her. "'We are supposed to have come to see the pictures, and over there—' and she pointed to the stalls in front of the houses at a right angle to the rue de doyenne look there are dealers in curiosities and pictures your cousin lives there i know it but she must not see us and what do you want to do said the baron who finding himself within thirty yards of madame marneffe's windows suddenly remembered her Hortense had dragged her father in front of one of the shops forming the angle of a block of houses built along the front of the old Louvre and facing the Hôtel de Nantes. She went into this shop. Her father stood outside, absorbed in gazing at the windows of the pretty little lady, who the evening before had left her image stamped on the old beau's heart, as if to alleviate the wound he was so soon to receive and he could not help putting his wife's sage advice into practice. "'I will fall back on a simple little citizen's wife,' said he to himself, recalling Madame Marneffe's adorable graces. "'Such a woman as that will soon make me forget that grasping Josepha.' Now, this was what was happening at the same moment outside and inside the curiosity shop. As he fixed his eyes on the windows of his new bell, the baron saw the husband, who, while brushing his coat with his own hands, was apparently on the lookout, expecting to see someone on the square. Fearing lest he should be seen, and subsequently recognized, the amorous baron turned his back on the Rue du Doyenne, or rather stood at three-quarters face, as it were, so as to be able to glance round from time to time. This manoeuvre brought him face to face with Madame Marneffe, who, coming up from the quay, was doubling the promontory of houses to go home. Valérie was evidently startled as she met the baron's astonished eye, and she responded with a prudish dropping of her eyelids. "'A pretty woman,' exclaimed he, "'for whom a man would do many foolish things.' "'Indeed, monsieur,' said she, turning suddenly, like a woman who has just come to some vehement decision. "'You are monsieur le baron Hulot, I believe?' The baron, more and more bewildered, bowed assent. Then, as chance has twice made our eyes meet, and I am so fortunate as to have interested or puzzled you, I may tell you that, instead of doing anything foolish, you ought to do justice. My husband's fate rests with you. And how may that be? asked the gallant baron. He is employed in your department in the war office, under Monsieur Lebrun, in Monsieur Coquet's room said she with a smile i am quite disposed madame 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 marneffe dear little madame marneffe to do injustice for your sake i have a cousin living in your house i will go to see her one day soon as soon as possible bring your petition to me in her rooms pardon my boldness monsieur le baron you must understand that if i dare to address you thus it is because i have no friend to protect me Aha! 
monsieur you misunderstand me said she lowering her eyelids hulot felt as if the sun had disappeared i am at my wit's end but i am an honest woman she went on about six months ago my only protector died marshal montcornet ah you are his daughter yes monsieur but he never acknowledged me that was that he might leave you part of his fortune he left me nothing he made no will indeed poor little woman the marshal died suddenly of apoplexy but come madame hope for the best the state must do something for the daughter of one of the chevalier bayard of the empire madame marneffe bowed gracefully and went off as proud of her success as the baron was of his where the devil has she been so early thought he watching the flow of her skirts to which she contrived to impart a somewhat exaggerated grace she looks too tired to have just come from a bath and her husband is waiting for her it is strange and puzzles me altogether madame marneffe having vanished within the baron wondered what his daughter was doing in the shop as he went in still staring at madame marneffe's windows he ran against a young man with a pale brow and sparkling gray eyes wearing a summer coat of black merino coarse drill trousers and tan shoes with gaiters rushing away headlong he saw him run to the house in the rue du doyenne into which he went hortense on going into the shop had at once recognized the famous group conspicuously placed on a table in the middle and in front of the door even without the circumstances to which she owed her knowledge of this masterpiece it would probably have struck her by the peculiar power which we must call the brio the go of great works and the girl herself might in italy have been taken as a model for the personification of brio not every work by a man of genius has in the same degree that brilliancy that glory which is at once patent even to the most ignoble beholder thus certain pictures by raphael such as the famous transfiguration the madonna di foligno and the frescoes of the stanza in the vatican do not at first captivate our imagination as do the violin player in the chiara palace the portraits of the doria family and the vision of ezekiel in the pity gallery the christ bearing his cross in the borghese collection and the marriage of the virgin in the brera at milan the saint john the baptist of the tribuna and saint luke painting the virgin's portrait in the academia at rome have not the charm of the portrait of leo x and of the virgin at dresden and yet they are all of equal merit nay more the stanza the transfiguration the panels and the three easel pictures in the vatican are in the highest degree perfect and sublime but they demand a stress of attention even from the most accomplished beholder and serious study to be fully understood while the violin player the marriage of the virgin and the vision of ezekiel go straight to the heart through the portal of sight and make their home there it is a pleasure to receive them thus without an effort if it is not the highest phase of art it is the happiest this fact proves that in the begetting of works of art there is as much chance in the character of the offspring as there is in a family of children that some will be happily graced born beautiful and costing their mothers little suffering creatures on whom everything smiles and with whom everything succeeds in short genius like love has its fairer blossoms this brio an italian word which the french have begun to use is characteristic of youthful work it is the fruit of an impetus and fire of early talent an impetus which is met with again later in some happy hours but this particular brio no longer comes from the artist's heart instead of his flinging it into his work as a volcano flings up its fires it comes to him from outside inspired by circumstances by love or rivalry often by hatred and more often still by the imperious need of glory to be lived up to this group by wenceslas was to his later works what the marriage of the virgin is to the great mass of raphael's 
the first step of a gifted artist taken with the inimitable grace the eagerness and delightful overflowingness of a child whose strength is concealed under the pink and white flesh full of dimples which seem to echo to a mother's laughter prince eugene is said to have paid four hundred thousand francs for this picture which would be worth a million to any nation that owned no picture by raphael but no one would give that sum for the finest of the frescoes though their value is far greater as works of art hortense restrained her admiration for she reflected on the amount of her girlish savings she assumed an air of indifference and said to the dealer what is the price of that fifteen hundred francs replied the man sending a glance of intelligence to a young man seated on a stool in the corner the young man himself gazed in a stupefaction at m hulot's living masterpiece hortense forewarned at once identified him as the artist from the color that flushed a face pale with endurance she saw the spark lighted up in his gray eyes by her question she looked on the thin drawn features like those of a monk consumed by asceticism she loved the red well-formed mouth the delicate chin and the pole's silky chestnut hair if it were twelve hundred said she i would beg you to send it to me it is antique mademoiselle the dealer remarked thinking like all his fraternity that having uttered this ne plus ultra of bric-a-brac there was no more to be said excuse me monsieur she replied very quietly it was made this year i came expressly to beg you if my price is accepted to send the artist to see us as it might be possible to procure him some important commissions and if he is to have the twelve hundred francs what am i to get i am the dealer said the man with candid good humor to be sure replied the girl with a slight curl of disdain oh mademoiselle take it i will make terms with the dealer cried the livonian beside himself fascinated by hortense's wonderful beauty and the love of art she displayed he added i am the sculptor of the group and for ten days i have come here three times a day to see if anybody would recognize its merit and bargain for it you are my first admirer take it come then monsieur with the dealer an hour hence here is my father's card replied hortense then seeing the shopkeeper go into a back room to wrap the group in a piece of linen rag she added in a low voice to the great astonishment of the artist who thought he must be dreaming for the benefit of your future prospects monsieur wenceslas do not mention the name of the purchaser to mademoiselle fischer for she is our cousin the word cousin dazzled the artist's mind he had a glimpse of paradise whence this daughter of eve had come to him he had dreamed of the beautiful girl of whom lisbeth had told him as hortense had dreamed of her cousin's lover and as she had entered the shop ah thought he if she could be but like this the look that passed between the lovers may be imagined it was a flame for virtuous lovers have no hypocrisies well what the deuce are you doing here her father asked her i have been spending twelve hundred francs that i had saved come and she took her father's arm twelve hundred francs he repeated to be exact thirteen hundred you will lend me the odd hundred and on what in such a place could you spend so much ah that is the question replied the happy girl if i have got a husband he is not dear at the money a husband in that shop my child listen dear little father would you forbid my marrying a great artist no my dear a great artist in these days is a prince without a title he has glory and fortune the two chief social advantages next to virtue he added in a smug tone oh of course said hortense and what do you think of sculpture it is very poor business replied hulot shaking his head it needs high patronage as well as great talent for government is the only purchaser it is an art with no demand nowadays where there are no princely houses no great fortunes no entailed mansions no hereditary estates only small pictures and small figures can find a place the arts are endangered by this need of small things 
but if a great artist could find a demand said hortense that indeed would solve the problem or had some one to back him that would be even better if he were of noble birth pooh a count and a sculptor he has no money and so he counts on that of mademoiselle hortense hulot said the baron ironically with an inquisitorial look into his daughter's eyes this great artist a count and a sculptor has just seen your daughter for the first time in his life and for the space of five minutes monsieur le baron hortense calmly replied yesterday you must know dear little father while you were at the chamber mamma had a fainting fit this which she ascribed to a nervous attack was the result of some worry that had to do with the failure of my marriage for she told me that to get rid of me she is too fond of you to have used an expression so unparliamentary hortense put in with a laugh no she did not use those words but i know that a girl old enough to marry and who does not find a husband is a heavy cross for respectable parents to bear well she thinks that if a man of energy and talent could be found who would be satisfied with thirty thousand francs for my marriage portion we might all be happy in fact she thought it advisable to prepare me for the modesty of my future lot and to hinder me from indulging in too fervid dreams which evidently meant an end to the intended marriage and no settlements for me your mother is a very good woman noble admirable replied the father deeply humiliated though not sorry to hear this confession she told me yesterday that she had your permission to sell her diamonds so as to give me something to marry on but i should like her to keep her jewels and to find a husband myself i think i have found the man the possible husband answering to mamma's prospectus there in the place du carrousel and in one morning oh papa the mischief lies deeper said she archly well come my child tell the whole story to your good old father said he persuasively and concealing his uneasiness 